Uh, today's Pandemonium U class is the fifth in our series, kindly sponsored by the Federation of Alliance Française USA, which promotes French language and culture through its more than 100 Alliance Française chapters across the United States. Their website is afusa.org. So it's a thrill to introduce our two guests today. Uh, Claude Fischler is a French sociologist and an anthropologist who essentially created the interdisciplinary field of uh, food studies in France. He has run institutes and been an esteemed researcher at many of France's top institutions. And he's the author of many books and papers. One of his well-known books is called Manger, French Europeans and Americans Confront Food. Our other guest today is Guillemette Farr. She spent 12 years as a journalist in New York for Le Figaro and other publications. And she now writes a wonderful weekly column for the weekend magazine of Le Monde. It's called M Magazine. I'm sure many of you have seen it. She's written, written many books. I'm very jealous of her output. She seems to do a book a year. Uh, and one of them is called Dinner Parties, a how-to. So welcome to you both. Uh, you're both in Paris as well, though in your homes. Um, Claude, I'll start with you. You've written a lot about the difference between meals in America and France. And one big difference is that in America, you're allowed to call your host ahead of time and say, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a, on the paleo diet, I don't eat shrimp, uh, whatever you want. But in France, you can't do that. Why? You can, you can try it, but you won't be invited back. Why not, Claude? Well, it's not that bad, but um, it's uh, basically, I mean, to make a very long story short, there are two different views of what a meal, a shared meal consists of. To the French, a meal, first of all, a meal is the essence of eating. If you, have, if you don't have a meal, for instance, if you eat a sandwich standing at the counter of your local uh, bar, you don't call that eating. You come home late at night and you say, uh, come on, let's have dinner. I haven't, I haven't eaten today. Uh, so to eat is to have a, a meal, and a meal consists of a place, some space, some time, some uh, people condition, some order, etc. So once you have a meal, a meal is viewed somehow as a communion. And the communion, of course, involves people sharing in the uh, Eucharist. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the communion, you have to, you're not going to uh, complain that uh, the host might, might have uh, gluten, right? So, um, that's the, the obligation is to share. Now, in the American view, I've come to the conclusion that a meal is more like a contrast in a good Protestant uh, ethics, you know, as, uh, as uh, Weber would say. So uh, you meet, you're going to have food together, you have to pick some place. So there is a negotiation and it's a contract. And once the contract is settled, you just have the meal, which consists of about 20 minutes together, and that's that. So you, Claude, no you've problem. also said, Claude, you've also said that for Americans, they're on this kind of personal journey of self-discovery to see what kind of food both best suits them, what diet is best suited to their body, but it, they don't see it as a kind of social experience. Well, it's not, it, obviously it cannot be the same uh, view of a social experience as someone who is supposed to share the uh, uh, the sacred uh, food that is sitting in the, in the middle of the table, right? So um, basically, I mean, I can, I can see that people, when they get the calls like uh, inviting French people, inviting American friends, and they get the call two days ahead, and uh, I have to remind you that uh, I don't eat this and my wife doesn't eat that, I mean, I've seen people that are driven crazy by that. They're shocked. They think, what kind of brattish, uh, childish, uh, you know, uh, difficult, uh, finicky people are these, you know? <laughs> but so what, that's, so that's I've a, read one study that I think is from your book that says 68% of French adults say they force themselves to eat some of everything when they're at a dinner. Oh, but I mean, I've seen, even, I to... I've seen even better. I was sitting once at an official dinner next to a lady... Uh, very posh in style, and she, we, we start a conversation, she tells me she's a vegetarian, and uh, oh, and what happens if you're invited to people, etc. She said, it just happened to me last week, I was invited to people I didn't know well, and um, um, the, the proud um, 
lady of the house announced that her husband had been bringing from hunting part uh, some some um, boar meat from a hunting party and that was going to be the, the the menu and she you know so i said what did you do well she said i you know i i thought maybe i could do the uh, the anorexic uh, uh, spiel you know uh, like uh, cutting the meat in little pieces and hiding it under the fork and uh, or I but could. You, um, so you have to eat something. You, you kind of. So, well, finally, I said, "What did you do?" And she said, "I ate it." <laughs> and when I tell this story to an American friend, he's just shocked. Because the meal is the being together. It's the shared moment. It's not just about the food. Well, yeah, yeah. And as as I think Guillemette reminds this in her book, that uh, the French word compagnon or copain is based on uh, a pan is uh, the, uh, bread, the sharing bread. Yeah, so compan the, means the, friend, the, the, and any, it's also, yeah. Uh, companion, uh, same company, I was, you know, the corporate world is always surprised to hear that it's about sharing bread, you know, company. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you the sharing is the most important. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we'll get back to some shared American meals, but Guillemette, you spent a lot of time writing this book, Dîner en Ville. It's, it loosely translates as dinner party, but it's not, it's just a type of dinner party, right? Can you tell us what a Dîner en Ville is? Like, uh, a Dîner en Ville is uh, a dinner party uh, that would be a kind of a social event and that you, it's something uh, where you won't necessarily know everybody in advance. The idea is it, like, it's a very blurred line between something that's both a little bit business, but not too business. Like it, it's, it's not something explicit. The idea is that you're going to extend your area of influence with the people that you're going to meet there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I got att attracted to this idea of working on, uh, on dinner parties because when I lived in New York, um, Every time that would be like a big, uh, a big discussion between expats that people would say like, oh, I, I, I feel like I have no friend, have been here for two years or three years and I'm not invited to dinner parties. So I had to explain to people that there were no real dinner parties in a sense and French people would have dinner parties and it was not a mark of friendship to have people over to your place. That so if in, you in, had... in mm -hmm. France, it's very normal to, go, to do most of your socializing at dinner parties and not necessarily in restaurants. Yes, and it's also something of a, I think it has also become more like a, a kind of a strategy in uh, politics, in business, uh, because we have this law in France protecting uh, uh, private life that you can't, I, as a journalist, I can't write about something that's happening at people's place. So lots of dinner parties are happening uh, at people's place so you won't be, it's like a, you don't have to remind people that things are secret since it's happening at someone's place. It's definitely off the record. And who, so this is, I mean, uh, Claude, I think you said that the equivalent of the Dine en Ville would be like a power lunch maybe, but it's less Except explicitly <laughs> about, it's less explicitly about business. You're not, you might not even know in advance who's coming or, and sometimes you're introduced to someone as like, Oh, he works in publishing and it turns out like he owns the whole like newspaper industry. The <laughs> difference, the difference, I think, reading, having read the book, uh, I think the difference is there is no uh, topic, the predefined topic. And it's quite the opposite because most of the uh, Dine en Ville consists of people who don't know each other, have never seen each other and are in totally different areas. Right? Uh, yeah, Guillaume, you said there's a kind of formula for how to create this sort of perfect French or Parisian dîner en ville. What, who should you invite? Should you invite like, people from the same field or? Like for instance, people would mention that you're not supposed to invite to a, a dîner en ville somebody that you could have lunch with. So meaning that exactly that so somebody was for a power lunch, you're not supposed to talk about business, you're not supposed to talk about money, and you're not going to invite people who work in the same area because if they work in the same area, they might uh, tend to compete against each other, like uh, feeling like, uh, and also they, they might be less free about what they talk about because they're gonna watch themselves against the other person who is here in the room. Yeah, and uh, just before we get more into the dinner, 
what if you're oh. if the dinner is called for 8 30 what time are you supposed to show up for the the dinner what's the rule uh 8 45 like you're supposed to arrive like 15 minutes later than what you're invited at and i would say that what's funny is that what you call in english fashionably late it's called uh, le quart d'heure de politesse in france meaning like a, a quarter of an hour to be polite where instead of saying uh, we don't even use Quart d'heure de politesse does not even use the term late or retard. <laughs> and, um, and you don't, like in America, it's quite common when you're invited to someone's house to see their whole, you get the house tour when you come in. At the French dinner party, the house remains a mystery. You only get to see the public spaces. Why is that? Uh, well, I, I think it's uh, exactly about this idea of privacy. Like I, I, I mentioned also in the book that, uh, like for instance, uh, Total, the French corporation CEO, used to rent an apartment to have dinner at an apartment that was not even his apartment. So meaning that when, when you order food from a cook and when you rent an apartment, you could say like, well, at this point, maybe we can go to a restaurant. But that's, that's the idea that you have to feel at someone's place. And, and by that, you don't like uh, own the place. <laughs> so Claude, you, you've written about this too. Why is it so important to eat in people's homes for the French? Oh, is it? I don't, they like restaurants too, you know? That's true. Um, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's just uh, the, 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 they don't like to blur, I mean, so far, because it seems to be, it seems to be changing lately with the uh, lockdown. Uh, but the, the, the French don't like the blurring between public and private. And so um, the, um, the uh, even when you have uh, some a reception i mean it's just like going to a psychiatrist i mean you're going to a shrink you're not expect to see uh, his bathroom <laughs> you know, um, no, both of you. Uh, I, no, I just wanted to add that you can't understand the french political life of the past years if you don't understand dinner parties because for instance uh, uh, nicolas sarkozy met his wife, Carla Bruni, at a personal uh, private, uh, at a dinner party. Uh, François Hollande met Emmanuel Macron at the, for the first time uh, during a dinner party. And then Emmanuel Macron, who was not a minister yet, uh, had a dinner party where he invited François Hollande. And there, there were like all the CEO that he invited. So François Hollande was very impressed by how many people is, uh, this young Emmanuel Macron would know. And then when he was a minister, he was known as a serial dinner, that somebody, uh, there, there was this rumor that he could, that he and his wife could have uh, two dinner parties in a row at their apartment in Bercy. So, so all the last, and, and um, Francois Hollande, when he was single, uh, he was bored to death at the Elysee and he would accept any kind of invitation to, to people's dinner parties, but he would not go to a restaurant because then once again, once you are in a restaurant, you can, people could write about it or could mention that, they, and the rule, when you are at someone's uh, uh, house for a dinner party that you know that nobody is going to talk about, uh, I mean, write about, about the dinner party. And what's interesting about Paris too, and it helps create these, these uh, elite dinner parties, is that you have the artistic class, the political class, the business class, all in run one city, whereas in America, this tends to be separated. So you can bring all those people together in a way that you couldn't. Uh, I think it, uh, Karl Lagerfeld famously said that he is only interested in uh, people who do things that he can't do. And I think that is the promise of a dinner party that you're going to, to invite people to make them meet people who do things that they can't do. Claude, you've written about Thanksgiving as well as the kind of one, and there's also a Christmas dinner. But they, these are the main big dinners. What what is it that surprises you about Thanksgiving, and that often surprises French people? I, I haven't really uh, observed uh, up close uh, Thanksgiving dinners, but I hear about them, and uh, it seems to it seems to to be pretty short and uh, and simple. That is, everything is brought at the table simultaneously, right? Yeah. And also there's the fact that not everyone necessarily starts eating at the same time, which is exactly. France, that, yeah. So there's no synchrony and uh, no synchronization. And it's, but, but basically that's the main feature of the French meal is of course that it's a, a sequential uh, thing. So, uh, you know, if you ask the French what, what, 
what does a meal consist of, they will automatically tell you entrée, plat, dessert, at last, at least. That's the minimal. Uh, yeah. So entrée, plat, dessert, not uh, starter, together. Starter, main course, and dessert. Starter, right. main course, and dessert. So um, you have to go through the, 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 the whole sequence. And of course, um, traditionally, it, was, it took a lot longer because there were more uh, uh, stations in the in the in the sequence. Yeah. Well, but but it is um, yeah, that's another feature of French meals that's um, in contrast to the American style, which is the the timing of meals, when the French eat, and how long they eat. Claude, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, well, we have very good statistics and comparative statistics about that, you know, because most um, statistical institutes in the developed world run uh, time use surveys in which people keep diaries, large samples of people, they keep diaries over one or two days around the year. And every 15 minutes or so, they write what they're, what they're doing. So you can tell um, when people are eating, for instance. And it's very striking that if you compare France, UK, US, you can see that there are different times of day when the largest number or the, the largest proportion of people are at the same time eating. So if it's 12.30 in France, basically, you have between 12.30 and one o'clock, say, uh, you, you can tell there's 50% of the French that are busy eating. Okay, now if you look at the British or the American data, it's more or less the same or similar. Uh, you find that the time of day when you have most people eating at the same time, that's in Britain, for instance, it's 110, and there's a, a mere 17.5% of people eating. So basically, the French are the, the, the country that's very robust data in all the surveys we have that. It's the, the, among all the, the, the Western countries, but, but, but not just the Western countries, the one country where people keep meal times most strictly. And then the, the other thing which is interesting is that in most uh, countries, including France, you have the same pattern of people spending less and less time preparing food. Okay, that holds true for France as well over the last decades. But uh, when you look at how long people eat, uh, how long time, how long people spend, uh, uh, how much time people spend eating daily, you find that has been going down too. Not in France, less in France, as a matter of fact. And it's interesting to see that uh, when the French spend something like one hour and a half, uh, or so, if I remember correctly, a day eating, the, the uh, Americans, for instance, have a a mere 53 minutes or so. So it's kind of strange to observe that in countries like Mexico or Canada or US, where people spend very little time eating daily, they also have large numbers, large proportion of obese people, which sounds contradictory. So how do you Paradoxical. explain that? How, do you, how can you explain that, Claude? Well, it's probably the fact that if you don't eat meals, if you eat between meals, if you nibble, if you snack, uh, it's more difficult to remember uh, how much you have eaten and how long you've been eating. And that's actually what happens in, all, in, the, in other types of surveys. You can realize that people always try to remember what they've been eating by using what did I have for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner? And the rest goes forgotten, more or less. And the interesting thing is that the French have another feature. They don't snack. It's been bad. Uh, it's been considered uh, evil almost to, to nibble between meals uh, ever since the, the Middle Ages, according to my historian friends, and for, for all, all kinds of religious reasons, etc. And uh, another thing is they don't drink. I mean, they don't drink. They do, obviously, but uh, they have a smaller per capita consumption of sodas compared to everybody else. So um, that's the, those are some features that, of course, uh, tend to uh, decrease. Let's admit that uh, they, 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 there is you, change you going on. There, there have also, you mentioned studies that show that um, the more there are food rules and regulations, cultural rules, 
the less likely people are to be overweight. So, so highly codified tables. To people right. Does it, it's, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that, but it might be a dimension. So it started I mean, 30 or 40 years ago, the British anthropologist Mary Douglas was counting. She was looking at, at, at people's eating patterns in England in particular, uh, the, the uh, cultural uh, menu, as you like, the way people who eat, who, who would eat, for instance, on a Sunday night as uh, um, like a computer program, you know, how many instructions. And uh, so it, it's a very good metaphor. She, you can uh, describe a, a, an eating pattern in terms of instructions and rules. And we, the, the interesting thing, and that's the main difference between French, Italians on, the, on one side and or Spaniards and Americans on the other side, is that uh, the French tend to execute the script unknowingly, which is probably what most people on the face of earth have been doing forever. You know, they don't decide what they're going to eat uh, by just uh, deciding every molecule they're going to put into their body. Right. But um, they, um, they apply a script, which is, you know, it's like language uh, rules, like the grandma rules. You're not thinking of, of the grandma when you speak, the syntax. And, and Claude, in itself. America, we, we often say that we don't have rules, that we each decide for ourselves what we want to do. We're That's an individual the point. culture. But that That's itself is a rule. That's a cultural belief. That's a cultural, it's, it's the individualistic uh, program, of course. But, but the problem is that it's not that easy to make decisions about every single molecule you're going to put into your mouth, into your body, and with, with the, the belief that it's going to inform what you are and how you're going to evolve and your health and everything. You are yeah. what you eat. Yeah. We're getting lots of questions about the rules of French dinners. And we should say that we were talking about sort of the elite bourgeois dinner parties, but this yeah. also applies to sort of the rest of us who go to normal dinners at people's house. People are asking, what, um, uh, what, to bring. what should you bring? And, and you uh, can, I'm sure you saw some of the questions on chat too. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I was impressed with the number of questions regarding what to bring. Um, uh, first thing, uh, the thing about flowers, uh, the uh, old fashioned etiquette say that you should not bring flowers with you because you're gonna add some uh, uh, some burden on the host who is already cooking and so but what you should do is to, to get flowers delivered uh, like in the morning or the day before but that was something that people would do at the time when uh, the wife would be at home uh, the whole day and now it's not the case any, uh, so if 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 you bring flowers, people would uh, would try to do that before the dinner party. And regarding wine, um, some people are annoyed when people bring wine because they've prepared the wine already, and so they feel pressure to serve the wine that has been brought to them. And so the a safer bet would be to bring a chocolate or something that people would eat for for dessert, or to get to get the flowers delivered the next day. And also uh, um, regarding uh, another uh, faux pas that Americans wonder about is that it seems that the French body is made in such a way that nobody never needs to leave the table during a dinner party to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so uh, I, I, it's, I, I have to say that it's quite, quite uncommon that people would leave the table to go to the bathroom. And so they, if, and if you do that, you, uh, if you need to go to the bathroom, you say that you need to wash your hand. It's like uh, rejecting like any kind of body function. And, <laughs> and same thing about uh, the phones, obviously, that you're not going to, to take a phone call during the, uh, during the meal. I, I once had a, some French friends over to watch a soccer game, the, the World Cup championships at, at our house. And I, I just put out like pizzas and I thought we were all going to eat on the couch with pizzas. And they create, they set the table, they made us all leave the game and sit at the table. It's just, I think there's a, the, you, it's hard to sort of change the French food rules. No, but, and some, some of the rules, I wonder if there are rules to be followed or just rules to be known. Like you would, you would break the rule, but mention that you know them. Like for instance, uh, having cheese a second time, like normally you're not supposed to offer the cheese a second time around uh, during the dinner party because 
uh, accepting cheese a second time is like saying you, you were not full with the bill. Mm -hmm. uh, but so people would say like, oh, this cheese is so good that I know I should not do that, but I'm going to have like a second serving. And, and same thing like uh, for uh, eating your dessert with a fork. Uh, people would joke about that, like, sorry, that uh, there are some spoons or... Yeah, I did that. May I, may I just remark that this, this is, as you said, it's not an all across the social classes. It's, it's, it's not as subtle. It's, it may be very different. For yeah. instance, Bourdieu, the sociologist, insisted, I'm not sure he was so right after all, but insisted that in popular uh, uh, milieus, uh, uh, it's just much less formal than it is in the um, bourgeois dinner parties, but yeah, it's but just some that it's another like not, form. Sorry. Some things like not eating between meals, uh, not snacking, that goes across, I think, class lines. It's something that you learn in, in crash in school. And well, but that's a different thing. It wouldn't occur to people to do it. It's not, not something, those are different kinds of things. You have social norms and you have um, good manners, uh, codes, okay? And codes of good manners are part of the culture of a social class. And the, um, the uh, what I call the scripts, the cultural script is something that people don't realize they're applying. It's people always are been asking that way. If the scripts are, if people are asking if the scripts are changing a little bit, if the newer generation watching TV, getting Deliveroo, get to their house, if, that, if the rules are changing. Yeah, uh, you could see, uh, sorry, please forgive me. No, no, go, go ahead, Claude. No, it's been, I, I remember seeing in the Metro uh, recently, there was a campaign of uh, posters for one delivery uh, service. And uh, manger à la rache. Now, Pamela, okay. you translate that. I, I don't know what... Manger know. à la rache. So, so, I mean, the picture was of two teenagers sitting on the, on the floor and eating uh, from a bag that the was go. delivered. Eating on the go. No, no, I mean, it's, it's even more... Uh, uh, transgressive than that, you know, it's uh, this thing like uh, uh, We're getting lots of suggestions for, for how to yeah. translate that. Um, I, I wanted to get on to one other, we were getting such great yeah. questions on the chat and we should get to those, but I wanted to get on to the question of what we, t you, you're at the table in France for so long. One of the people in chat had noted that what most people talk about at a French meal is what they're having for the next meal, um, which was my, has been my experience as well. Um, but what are, at a, at a dinner, French dinner party, what are some of the topics that you're allowed to talk about? What's taboo and how might that compare with the U.S.? Guillemette. Uh, I think the old saying that you don't talk about politics and uh, religion, I think it's not true anymore about politics because politics has become some kind of a pop culture now. And talking about politics is like talking about pop culture. But I think uh, it's, I mean, uh, for my book, when I asked people if they had uh, attended dinner parties where there was some fight or pe people leaving the table, um, most of the time it was for uh, discussions uh, around the religion. A, a friend uh, of mine has a rule, don't talk about kids, jobs, or real estate. I think, I think you're supposed to talk about your host kids, like to show that you know about them, that you remember their names and the way, which school they go to. And, but you're not supposed to talk about your kids. <laughs> and, and, no, and, and that's, all, that's also something is that uh, you understand when you're invited to a dinner party that you're not going to bring your kids. And if you ask, an, uh, uh, should we come with the kids? The answer might be that uh, our kids will probably be in bed, but of course you can come with yours and you understand that you're never going to do that. Also, you're, you ask if you can bring anything and they say no, which does not mean no. Uh, of course. <laughs> like it would be very rude uh, not to bring anything. <clears throat> and and uh, I think in a, in America, another contrast with American dinner parties is we all want to sort of get along and agree, and especially now with the political climate so charged, nobody wants to talk about any. But in French dinner parties, there's a kind of an art to, to disagreeing and to having someone there even who everybody's against. Uh, how does that work? I would say that uh, not only disagreeing, but interrupting someone uh, is 
it's our way to show to express interest, which is uh, always surprising uh, for an American uh, audience. What considered as rude is not to interrupt, is to have like aparte, like uh, to have like a, a, a special side conversation with an uh, with an extra guest. That that you should not do that, unless everyone is having side conversations. Right. right. Yeah. Um, pe people are asking in the chat about the goûte. Um, Claude, we'll, we'll bring that back to you. Can you tell us about what the goûte is and what it means to the French? And at what age do you stop having a goûte? Very early, I would say. A goûte is a, is a, is a, it's, it's difficult when you run a survey, a particularly international comparative survey, it's very difficult. There's been a lot of, uh, disagreements with foreign colleagues about uh, whether it should be classified as a snack or as meal. And it's actually a meal. It's just an informal meal for kids. I remember about 10 years ago, we ran In the late survey. afternoon, right? At four o'clock or so? Four o'clock, yeah, after school. Because, um, so I, we ran a study, a survey uh, about less than 10 years ago in, in a small town in the west of France. And um, the, uh, um, it was working class, mostly the sample. And 80% uh, of the kids who were having goûté were having the goûté seated at a table. Uh, so they came back from school, etc. In my memories, it was just that I would get a pain au chocolat or a piece of baguette with a a piece of chocolate uh, stuck into it. And that was my goûte when I was picked up from school. And then at what age do you stop having goûte? Am I allowed to have a goûte? <laughs> Guillemette? I never oh, stopped. I, mean, I, I guess you can, I guess you can, you can call it an, a goûte and uh, be excused for uh, having a snack. <laughs> uh, and another uh, thing that people were asking about was about uh, apéro dinatoire, which means like something that's between uh, apéro and uh, dinner party. And I think when, when we're talking about uh, generation change, that's something that's really uh, developing. And I think also that in Paris, when, where people have a, a very dense schedule, it allowed the host to have uh, to attract like a broader audience to the dinner parties because if you start with a long long uh, apéro, then people can arrive uh, later, and so because of that, people tend now to skip cheese, so the dinner can end earlier if you, especially if you had like a long uh, apéro before. And, and you know the thing is the aperitif dinatoire is uh, across the social uh, spectrum. I mean, yeah. it's really something that you find everywhere. It's informal, it's uh, associated with, uh, I don't know, uh, vacations, weekends, uh, things like that. And you can bring in the children, which is not, uh, the whole family can be uh, involved. So it's a, it's a form of very, it satisfied the French taste for aperitif, which is not so much about drinking, but about nibbling within a special uh, everything has to be done in some kind of order with the French. I mean, that's the difference with the, with Americans. But you know, um, I mean, what I find most striking is the way Americans look at French rules and vice versa. You know, uh, the French complain that Americans eat all the time, nonstop. Uh, they, uh, they have no rules, they go to the refrigerator and uh, my students come back from the sessions in the US uh, and uh, they've, uh, they've put on about uh, several kilos, you know, and they say, yeah, of course, I mean, no, any, everywhere you go, there is food. So uh, it's like being in, in, in a big um, temptation and you have to resist uh, whereas in France, you're uh, stimulated to have food within certain situations. You're not... Uh, and, and, and you're expected from quite a young age to be able to be hungry, to cope with hunger, to recognize that as a sort of signal to your body to eat. I think for children, that's very important. Yeah, well, as you noted in uh, bringing up Bebe. And um, another issue that's always struck me, Guillaume, at French dinner parties, uh, sorry if you want to go on to something else too, 
is just a male female situation. You're not necessarily expected to arrive with your spouse. You can socialize on your own. That's considered normal. And when you do come with a partner, you're very quickly separated from them. You're set, you, you're sat next to someone else. They sit at the, of the opposite sex often. And and even uh, uh, more aware the, the idea that you are allowed to sit next to your partner during the first year after getting married. <laughs> so I don't know how you're supposed to check that out. Like when when did people meet? But uh, but it's true that I uh, even with the, when the idea that you would have like uh, gay couples at the table, but the, the idea that uh, uh, making the plan de table with uh, one man, one woman, one man, one woman, is still like, even, uh, even with gay partners, people would still uh, pay attention to that. And even, and, when say, and even when someone, most of people uh, would pre prefer to have plan de table because they don't like the anxiety to wonder where, about uh, where to sit. So they prefer to be directed where to sit. And someone, a few people have asked about leaving food on the plate at the end of the meal. What, what's the, are you, are you supposed to clean your plate? We talk about the clean plate club in America. <laughs> uh, you, whatever you do, you're not supposed to talk about it. So I think uh, this is, I'll go back to what we said about asking if you have like any food requirement. The idea is that if there is something that you do not like or do not need, you don't mention it. Well, there's a generational thing here because to this day, I cannot bring myself to leave anything on the plate. Do you think it has to do with the war or what, what, where does that come from? No, I wasn't born. <laughs> um, so no, your parents um, would have, yeah. No, but it's just that, um, the, first of all, the, the, the portions are smaller. That, that's what I, would, I was about to say that it also goes to the size of the servings. Right. We did what? a study on that, as a matter of fact, and it was uh, always, always, everything was bigger on the American side and outside, on re in restaurants and supermarkets and everything. Just look at a, a, a jar of Dan and yogurt on both sides of the Atlantic. It's just amazing, the difference. But, and and uh, when you were say, talking about uh, snack, I think one uh, big uh, American and French difference is about the, the statue of the fridge and like serving yourself uh, going to the fridge to help yourself, like that's a big um, uh, area of uh, disagreement when there is an au pair in a French family, like when there is an American au pair, like, uh, like the idea, it's, it's almost like the fridge is like a coffre fort where they are, you're not supposed to have access on your own. Like a safe that's locked. Yeah, a safe. Um, one thing we, we uh, I think we have quite a, few, quite a lot of women on this call, and one thing we haven't talked about is women's relationship with food in the two countries. Um, I know that with, with American women, I'm sure you encountered this, Guillemette, when you lived in New York. There's a lot of talk of guilt. I can't believe, I hate myself, I just ate that piece of chocolate cake. Whereas the conversation in France is more about uh, pleasure and how much I enjoy that piece of chocolate cake, even if, it, even if we all know it's the only piece of chocolate cake that, that women will be eating you know, that week. What do, you, what do you see as the difference? Uh, I think also there is a big difference about the idea that what you eat as a story, especially in uh, dinner parties, uh, you're going to bring the wine and say that, oh, this is the wine that we bought uh, during the third vacation, or this is the uh, olive oil that uh, so-and-so is, uh, is doing in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his house in Provence. That is the idea of always, like, raising a story for uh, anything you eat or drink, I think that would uh, make a big difference. Claude, you've written about um, dieting in the US and how in France that diets, people, uh, people tend to be very suspicious of what you would call a diet. What, what, how do you see that? Well, I mean, there are diets on both sides of the Atlantic and a lot of dieting, but what is most striking is that uh, in France, we have fewer obese people than um, in many other countries, uh, particularly the States or Britain. But uh, what is seldom noted is that we have more underweight people, and 80 or 90 percent of those are women. So uh, there was this lady who wrote the book, French Women Don't Get Fat. Well, there's some substance to that. 
and um, and uh, you might want to understand it's just this symmetrical aspect of what we discussed earlier about obesity, and then it's apparently more e it's apparently easier to uh, restrain yourself in the French context than it is um, in other contexts because of course if you're not supposed to eat between meals and if you're supposed to eat according to a number of rules during meals uh, it's unlikely that you're going to make a pig of yourself during the meal right uh, yeah but when so, you were in New York did you start eating like an American did you find that that was sort of contagious well, when I arrived first, I didn't know that um, that you were not supposed to finish your plate. So in restaurant, I thought that it was much too big. Um, it took me some time to understand that I was not supposed to order an appetizer and an entree and eat both of them. But um, I was also struck when I came back to France, the company I worked for, uh, the, um, they were like, uh, it was an internet company and they were in their tw 20s and they said, well, let, let's have sandwiches for lunch. So I was surprised because 12 years before when I left, a uh, few people would do that. But what surprised me is that everybody went to the boulangerie together to buy their sandwich. They all came back together and then they sit down around the table and had, had sandwich. They didn't, nobody had uh, his sandwich at his desk. So even uh, going back to what um, Claude was saying, even with eating sandwich, they managed to make a, like a social meal out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I always like, I told you uh, when we prepared this, uh, Pamela, I told you the story, the comparative story. There was this writer, Paul Morand, who wrote about New York in the 30s, and he starts the description by saying, in New York, people don't go home for, for lunch. Apparently, the French were going home for lunch at that time. Uh, and they sit down at their desk and, uh, and eat while working, or they go to clubs or to cafeterias, and they stand in line with their hats on their heads, and um, it, it's all, uh, the food is good, it's not expensive, but uh, these, it's, the, these people behave as if they were in a, uh, the cattle in a stable, all right, so animal-like behavior, and the French uh, look at that as, as animal behavior. Now, I have a symmetrical view by an American in France in the 50s, a friend, an American sociologist, and he says, the French, no matter what the region is, they eat every day at the same time, and they go uh, about their meal in the same order, and there's no change. It's always according to tradition and same wine with same food, etc. Whereas to us, eating every day at the same time is more like the zoo. So each looks at the other, uh, at their ways of eating as animal-like, you know? So it's a very good example, I think, of the cultural glasses that we wear when we look at people's food habits across uh, um, cultural uh, borders. Um. It's a, a few people, we're going to have to just take a couple more questions, but a few people have talked about schools and the ro role that schools play in reinforcing the food rules. I mean, for me, as a foreigner here who's put my kids in school, it's been very striking to see that even from the earliest age, the kids are encouraged to have uh, four or five course meals, even from, you know, less than three years old. And that continues all the way through school. And the kids sit in the canteen and actually discuss the food. They have strong opinions. The parents want to know exactly how good the food was at, at lunch. Um, I, I think the expectations are much higher here than you would have in an American context, certainly. You forget complaints. <laughs> complaints. Complaining and the complaints. is part of the French but, picture, very much so. I mean, I even when you walk outside a French school, the idea that you would have the menu outside, I was wondering if you would have the same thing in an American school to have the menu hanging on the, on the street. Uh, right, for all the parents to see and discuss. And it's very important that there's no repeat meals. In, in right. one month, you have the nutritionist make sure that there, if you have cauliflower for once, you're not gonna have it again. And, and, also, always, the, sorry. and, and also the, the idea is that it's normal, it's to be expected that there will be things that you don't like, that it's kind of part of your education to be exposed to things that you don't like. That you can't have like a, a regular menu that will have only things that you like. As a kid. And that you should 
of course, taste the things that you don't like. Yeah. At least have one bite. Right. And that's, that's from daycare. There's 95% agreement uh, to the question uh, about uh, you have to taste things before deciding, etc. Get your children to taste things before deciding, etc. Me meaning that this, well, the science is on the side of the French in this one, that if you taste something you don't love multiple times, you're more likely to start to like it. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, experimental material shows that uh, it takes uh, familiarity to uh, predict um, uh, accept, uh, acceptance, yeah. I'll, I'll just ask one closing qu question to you both, because unfortunately we're gonna have to end soon, which is like, we, France has been under confinement, was under confinement for several months, and, and now we're slowly deconfining. Uh, I don't even know if that's a word in English. How it, the restaurants have been closed now, they're slowly opening. Are, are dinner parties starting again? Or is life going back to normal here? I've had three or four already. Yeah. One at my home and two uh, at other people's homes. So keeping reasonable distances and not, uh, not kissing. Uh, no bees, <laughs> no handshakes, that was respected. No masks either. What about you, Gamet? Yeah, I would say I would say the same thing. And I was also surprised during the lockdown by the number of stories of people bringing food to each other, uh, like going to the limit to what you could do and could be uh, socially accepted. Like questions about like, yeah, but if you bring uh, like a uh, food on a tray and you leave it behind their door, is that okay? Or so. <laughs> There was still this idea that you would maintain your connections by bringing food to each other. Well, I would say in defense of Americans that they brought each other a lot of lasagnas and casseroles too. So I think on that note, we probably are, are more similar than we, we'd like to think. Um, unfortunately, uh, like I said, we're gonna have to end it now. I wanna thank Guillemette and Claude so much for being with us. We're lucky to have um, such knowledgeable people at our table today and um, <laughs> looking forward to dining with both of you sometime soon. I hope that will happen. Um, just as a reminder,